Okay, so thank you very much for joining us this morning for our webinar discussing making employability and personal, personal development planning meaningful. Uh, my name is Amanda Wolf. I'm a marketing manager here at Palgrave, and we're delighted this morning to talk about this topic uh, with Barbara, Barbara Bassett. Good morning. Hello. Uh, so before I introduce you to Barbara properly, uh, we just have a couple of housekeeping uh, rules which we just want to cover. So to ensure that we don't have a problem with background noise, uh, we have muted all of your microphones. Um, but during this time, if you do have any questions um, or are having any problems, feel free to enter that in the, uh, the chat window or the questions window. Uh, we've saved some time at the end of the session to answer any questions. So um, if you do have any that come up throughout the webinar, please feel free to, to send those through to us. Um, and if we don't have the opportunity to answer all of the questions at the end of the webinar, um, we will be able to see who has asked which question and we can follow up with you by email afterwards. We're making a recording of this session, um, which we can send to you afterwards. Um, you can share it with any colleagues who you think might be interested um, or anyone that might have been unable to make it this morning. Okay, so now I'll just introduce you to Barbara. Uh, so Barbara is a senior lecturer at the Centre for Career and Personal Development at Canterbury Christchurch University. Um, she's a qualified careers advisor and has practiced for 11 years in schools and FE colleges before moving into teaching. In 2013, Barbara authored the Reflective Journal and earlier this month, the, the, the Employability Journal was published. Both titles encourage students to record and reflect upon their learning. In the webinar this morning, uh, firstly, Barbara will be talking through what PDP is and why students find it difficult. She'll be covering how we can support students in identifying their strengths, key skills, and areas for development. We'll move on to um, suggesting ideas to help students build career happiness and foster career resilience. Next, she'll be talking to you about the role of writing in critical reflection. We'll take a look at Barbara's new title, The Employability Journal, and finally, we'll take some of your questions. So now, over to Barbara. Thank you very much, Amanda. Uh, it's really great to be with you all today. Thank you for taking time out of your busy days um, to participate in the webinar. Um, you'll see from the title of the webinar, um, a degree is no longer enough. Um, this has become very much, I think, a mantra um, in terms of students needing more than their degree. Um, employers, we know, have been saying, you know, the degree is great, but we want experience, we want this, we want that on top. And so I think students are very clued into the idea that the degree that they will be gaining will no longer be enough within the labour market. So they need, you know, what could be called a degree plus. So if we look at the notion, first of all, of personal development planning, um, this, of course, is something that in... Um, in academia we've become used to. I mean, when I looked this up and found that actually it was in the QAA guidelines of two, from 2001 and basically was first talked about in 1997 in the Deering Review, I thought, oh my goodness, that, that's actually 20 years ago. So I've been talking about this notion of personal development planning for 20 years. Um, so if we look at this definition that you see on the slide in front of you, it's defined as a structured and supported process undertaken by an individual to reflect on their learning, performance, and or achievement, and to plan for their personal education and career development. And there are words there, I think, that I want to highlight. The first being structured. So the idea that the PDP process should be structured and that actually if students are going to benefit from it, it needs to be structured. But it also needs to be supported because we know what it's like. Um, you know, if we're in the workplace and we are we have a structure for our own development, 
actually, in order to make progress with that, we need support. So we need support in particular when the going might get tough for a number of reasons. Um, so this is quite, I think, a, quite an interesting definition. We've got the words planning. We've got the words reflect as well. And the words career development. Um, so we're going to think about all of those things during the webinar. The next thing we want to do is to pose this question to you. Certainly, when I talk to students about career development, I talk with them about their personal development as well. It's not something that they find particularly easy. So we've got a short poll for you to do. Um, in relation to what makes personal development planning difficult for students. And we've got some options there, five options for you. And if you could um, complete the poll in the next couple of minutes, that would be really good because it would be great to have your views on where the difficulties lie. Looking ahead, though, just for a couple of minutes, if we then look at what PVP is, we have another definition here by Jackson. And here, again, I have highlighted some words on the slide. So we've got planning, doing, recording, and reflection. And they're all topics that we're going to touch on in a few minutes. But we have all of that then underpinned by self-awareness and metacognition. Um, and we're going to, again, look at each of those terms in turn. So if we can look at what makes personal development planning difficult and your thoughts on that. We're just going to share the results of that. Okay, so we can see that the uh, the highest uh, percentage comes in uh, for the option they don't see the value in it, with 45% uh, of you selecting that option. 23% uh, is that many are unsure uh, what they want to do, so actually the um, per, uh, personal development is difficult. Um, and then 13% come in with uh, both it can involve discussing their limitations, which is obviously a bit uncomfortable, and then also 13% think they lack experiences to reflect on. Lovely, thank you. And thanks everybody for doing that because it gives me a feel for your thoughts and the work that you're doing with your students. Um, I think each of those points is, is really worth considering. Um, I think the idea that people don't see the value in it, I think for many students they don't see what it's for and they don't see how it can help them in the future. And so that's something that um, is definitely worth discussing. Um, I think in my own work, this idea of it being generally abstract, I think the, um, I think the students I work with um, see the whole area of career development. And even that word career itself can be very abstract. And it can also be quite scary. And I think that is linked with your thoughts that you've shared on um, it means that I'm going to need to look at the things that I'm not so good at and it means I might have to, I really should in fact think about addressing those issues which isn't necessarily very comfortable. So if we look at the words now that were on that slide, what is PDP? Um, then we're going to look at planning, doing, recording, and reflection. And these ideas about the underpinning of self-awareness and metacognition. So PDP then is difficult because planning. Well, planning is all very well when you know what you're planning for. 
But if you're trying to plan for something and you're not really clear about what you're planning for, then it really gets very, very difficult. You know, we could all imagine the scenario where we know we want to go on a holiday, but we've no idea where we want to go, but we know we need to plan for it. So where do we even start? So this whole notion of PDP, and of course it's in the title, Personal Development Planning. Um, planning is, is very difficult. And we're going to say things, I'm going to say some things in a, in a few minutes about the graduate labour market and how difficult it is. So planning is fine when you know what you want to plan for, but then we get into this whole area of doing. Now doing often is fine when I know what I'm doing. But again, when we look forward, doing often means that I need to get out of my comfort zone. So it means if you're thinking about my personal development, it implies that there will be things that will be new to me that I won't be able to do immediately. And that can be quite scary and it can be uncomfortable. Now when we think of that word recording, I don't know what it means to you, but recording to me often doesn't sound like the most exciting thing in the world. You know, we might get into our minds ideas of a log or, um, or some kind of journal. Um, but, you know, this idea of recording, well, is it only then about description? You know, that I write down what I do and I keep a log. Now, we all know that there's much more to it than that. But that word recording has those kinds of implications, I think. In relation to reflection, well, of course, reflection is time-consuming. Um, students lead busy lives. When we look at uh, the third year or the final year of undergraduate study, and when we look at our students, I think we see people who, where there are lots of demands on them, um, undoubtedly, some of you will have been involved in marking dissertations in the not too uh, distant past. And we know that the final year of undergraduate study is demanding, um, and indeed it should be. And students are already being asked to engage in a lot of reflection. And then we're asking them to engage in reflection in this area as well. Um, so it's time consuming. Then we get on to good old self-awareness. And self-awareness, of course, is great until we look at ourselves and we don't particularly always like what we see. Metacognition, of course, is a very abstract thing too, an abstract concept. So how then can we help students to reflect on their learning in a productive way. And this is where um, the, the books that I've written have been written as tools. They're reflective tools. They're designed to help students to reflect in a productive way. First of all, students really do need something to reflect on. So they need relevant and practical activities to think about. Reflection does not have to be and shouldn't be purely a solitary activity either. So they can have discussions with people such as their peers, their tutors, their mentors, in order to engage in reflection. And I think one of the things that's very important is that once we get into the area of reflection simply becoming filling boxes or ticking boxes, then we risk disengaging students from the process. So if we now move on to this notion of building career happiness and fostering career resilience, you'll see a diagram in front of you that has what I have termed the career learning and development bridge on it. 
there's been lots of theories that talk about well if you if you plan you match yourself to what you want to do in the future match yourself your skills your interests you then match yourself to what you want to do in the future then you plan um, for what you want to do on the surface that's not a bad idea but the difficulties with that come with the instabilities and the unpredictability of the labor market that we know our students will be going into. We know, actually, because we're already in it. So this career learning and development bridge model is something that I developed a few years ago to try to put across um, what students will need. So on the left, we have career happiness. On the right, career resilience. This is a suspension bridge, that, and we know suspension bridges work by the tension between those two things that keep the road in the middle, which has got the label career growth on it, they keep the road stable. That tension is actually necessary. And in order to achieve career growth, we need all to make progress within what Vygotsky calls our zone of proximal development. Now that's about focusing on the next step, what we can do next with the help and support from other people. So if we look then at career happiness, which is on the left-hand side of the bridge, this is about us supporting students in finding, it sounds a bit flaky, I know, but finding something that will make them happy. We all know how much time we spend at work and we need to enjoy uh, hopefully at least some of that time. This leads us into activities that will help students to, to explore their interests but also to discover their career anchors. In the bottom left, you can probably see the outline of an anchor there. Um, this idea of career anchors was originally put forward by Edgar Schein and has more recently been built on by Schein and Van Marnen. And our career anchors take us into an exploration of our values, the things that are important to us in work. Something that I won't be happy without. So I won't be happy unless I can have this particular anchor in my career. And these are some of the things that we need to enable students to explore. This involves looking at our strengths and our skills. And again, helping our students to examine these things. What are the things that they are really good at? And what are the things that they enjoy and that they get a buzz from? And some people find this difficult. Um, it can vary from student to student. Some people can do it more easily than others. Some of the clients that I work with, I've recently been working with some graduates, people who graduated last year, and you ask them about that, I ask them about their strengths and skills, and they don't find it necessarily easy. And they don't find it easy to remember, and this is where the recording of it is actually important. So a good exercise can be to ask students to write down every little bit of experience that they've had in their journey from, let's say, year 11 in secondary school through to their pending graduation. So then we move on to career resilience. Um, and this is about helping students to take the knockbacks. Resilience, you can see from the slide, there's this, you know, this is a, a, a classic image when you look at resilience of this tree that's managing to grow up through all this rocky, stony terrain. 
And career resilience means helping students to take risk, but also to manage risk. Because risk is important. It's important that we take risk, but that we don't take too much. By focusing on the next step, it's about managing risk. Not too much risk, so that we fall down every time and, they, and we get very disillusioned and very unhappy and face the question, well, I don't think I'll ever make it then, to not too little risk. Oh, well, that was pretty easy, wasn't it? So how far have I developed? Well, actually, not really very far. So it's about being clear about helping students to manage the risks that they're facing, not too much and not too little. But equally important in this is who will they turn to for support when things go wrong? Because taking risk will often involve things not going according to plan and getting some of those knockbacks. And in order to move forward, we all need support with that. So who can they go to for support? Also very important is getting feedback. Who can they go to to get feedback and how can they get the feedback that they need? So if you think of the student who goes to the, you know, the internship or the graduate traineeship and they get the rejection, how do they then get the feedback they need? So they need skills but they need strategies as well to be confident enough to go back and to say, so how can I develop? How can I improve my chances next time? A key aspect of resilience as well is being prepared for change. Now, of course, when we think about graduation, graduation for all students is a huge change. It's a huge transition. Many, I think, are beginning to articulate that it's a bigger change than actually going to university in the first place. I think many 18 and 19 year olds expect the big transition to be when they start university. In fact, most students then say, well, actually, the really big transition is what do I do after university when I come out of that, if you like, what we might call a uh, some kind of protected environment into the big labour market, the big wide labour market. So career resilience is very important. We then move on to looking at areas for development and this is very important for all students within the PDP process. They need to be of course exploring their areas for development. Now, this is where it gets tricky, and this is where several of you said in the poll, well, this is, this is difficult for students because this is where we begin to touch on weaknesses. You'll see that I've chosen to use the word development rather than weakness because I do believe that this is how students need to view it and how we as tutors need to portray it to them. It means helping students to assess themselves realistically so that they can manage those risks, but also so that they can see where they can improve. And the idea that this is a strength and not a weakness. So it's not about, oh, well, I can't do this because a weakness to me often um, implies I'm no good at this so I'll never be any good at it whereas an area of development is something that I can work on um, I know again from my uh, work with clients who are entering the labor market many employers want to hear about development they want to hear about learning and how the candidate for the job can learn and move forward. So development is incredibly important. 
I want to say a little bit next about the role of writing in reflection. And that brings me back to the employability journal. And um, if you do get hold of it, you'll see there's quite a bit about this in the introduction. So I'll be quite brief now. But this, the, the book is designed as a book that you write in by hand. Now, there are particular reasons why I chose to do that. And that's because of the focus that we get when we write by hand. Now, we know that we all use our VLEs. We all, you know, students put in their work. Um, they type it. They don't write it by hand. <coughs> Excuse me. But writing by hand does lead to a deeper level of reflection. And it also, there's evidence from neuroscience that shows that it engages our reticular activating system in our brains, which is basically the part of the brain that gives us focus. And it aids concentration. And it slows us down, so it enables us to reflect at a deeper level. Now, we will, in our definition that we looked at earlier um, on the what is PDP slide, we also, the next term was self-awareness and the metaphorical mirror. Now, self-awareness um, is, as we know, is fine when everything is going smoothly, but often we then need to engage in self-awareness and we don't like what we see. A bit like that bathroom mirror that we probably looked in this morning and we thought, right, okay, I need to take some action, or at least I did anyway. Um, so we look in these mirrors and as we can see um, from the slide, you know, this person is seeing herself from all angles and it can be uncomfortable. And because PDP involves self-awareness, this is where it can get a bit uncomfortable. Finally, um, we look at this idea then in bringing all of this together, um, planning for the future. If we are using all of these aspects in helping students to plan for the future, this final slide gives an idea of the kind of thing that we are trying to help them to plan for. Um, and you can just see by looking at it that it is extremely complex. It's no longer as simple as I'll do my degree, then enter this particular area, or maybe I'll do some postgrad study, and then I'm on this pathway through for the rest of my working life. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't some people that that happens to. I think there are, and I think they are, in my view would be, it'd be interesting to see what you feel about this, but my view would be that there are what I would call major professions, um, whether it, it could be things like law, medicine. I think there are still career paths like that. However, um, most of us um, will probably know that there will be people who will choose not to stay on that path. And that's obviously a different matter. But for many students, it's about trying to, to look at planning for something like this, which is extremely difficult. So my own argument and my argument with the clients and the students that I work with will be focus on the next step and see what happens. I know someone who has very, very recently gone into a new job with an employer, doesn't know, don't know what they're doing because it's a new area and the employer doesn't know what that area really means yet. So they're finding their way. And I think this is the very difficult thing that we are having to try to help to structure 
and support for our students. Excellent. Thank you very much, Barbara. That was uh, very interesting. Um, so, as, as mentioned, obviously, at the start, and I know Barbara touched upon it a little bit as well, um, I just wanted to, uh, to sum up and just explain a little bit about um, the Employability Journal. Um, so, it's now available. So, any of you who have previously um, requested inspection copies, um, if they haven't already arrived, they should be um, on their way to you now. Um, and we've also included a link at the bottom of the screen. So, if you would be interested um, in finding out more, you can uh, request your sample copies now. Um, so as Barbara mentioned, it's, it's a journal format book that's designed to be written in, um, and the book really provides um, some theoretical frameworks and a useful structure for students to process their learning, um, whether that's achieved via PDP modules on their degrees, um, placements, internships, um, really any of their sort of work-based experiences. In addition to these sort of theories and frameworks, the book contains activities um, and exercises that really help students um, to capture their learning and make the most of their experiences um, at university. So, um, yeah, absolutely. You can request copies of, of um, the book online now. Um, and then I think we have a couple of minutes. Uh, remaining. So if you have any questions, if you haven't already um, typed those into the, um, the question box or the chat box, if you'd like to, um, to do that now, um, and we can have a look at a couple of, um, of the questions that are coming in. Okay, so we have a question um, from someone who said, uh, this book is excellent, so thank you very much. Um, and uh, they've asked whether the journal diary is available again. Um, I'm not sure if you meant the reflective journal. So Barbara has two titles, the reflective journal and then also this new um, employability journal. Um, they're both available um, on our website and they're both still published. So yes, absolutely, they're both available. Um, someone has asked, how do we as academics support social and cultural capital acquisition? A post-1992 university competes with Oxford, for example. Social and cultural capital acquisition. Yes, it's really, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, because, of course, we know that um, employers, one of, the, one of the things that employers do look at is which university people have studied at. However, I think they also look at the experience that, that students have as well. Um, so I think some of that um, cultural cap capital and social capital has to come through networking. I know that this is one of the themes that I, I have identified in the, in the book, and that is this whole area of networking for students because it, it's terribly important. One thing I didn't say was the person I was referring to right at the end um, actually got the, the job that isn't really defined yet through networking. It was never advertised. And we all know about all the jobs that are never advertised. And I think networking is hugely important. And if you... you you are in a, I'm just looking at the question again, um, a post-1992 university. Um, it's about helping your students to build the confidence to get those networks and to get into networks. Um, so for instance, there are events that students can go to. There'll be events within things, the areas of work that they're interested in, but also um, by those placements, internships, part-time working, making the most of all the contacts that they are getting is hugely important. Um, we've had someone asking uh, whether there will be a recording of the webinar, and uh, the answer to that is yes. So we're recording it, and um, emails 
uh, with the link should be going out later on. Um, someone is asking uh, about um, feedback and badges. Um, I'm uh, not quite sure what's meant by that. Um, um, there are there are lots of reviews um, of the first edition of the Reflected Journal on Amazon. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if if that um, which is a good thing. Um, and so there would always be the opportunity to do that. Through that, would there be other opportunities as well for feedback? Um, I mean, we always welcome um, customer feedback. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. If, if people do have any feedback, then um, we're more than happy to receive that. Um, I think maybe the question might be from almost the academic perspective how. Um, lecturers or universities can assess the feedback that's included in the journals, as in what the students are writing, so if it's assessed. Ah, um, I see, right, okay. Um, so, um, in, in relation to what the students might write in, in their own journal, in the employability journal, for example, I think one thing that certainly could be done would be to ask students say as part of the assessment of um, uh, an employability module or a PDP module to write an evaluation of their reflections. Mm -hmm. I think that could be very helpful. There's lots of debates about whether or not people should, students should have their actual reflections assessed. And generally speaking, the thinking is that if a student knows that their reflections are going to be assessed, they won't really write what they think. Mm -hmm. So I think an evaluation, writing an evaluation of the um, reflections uh, could be a good way to go. Great, okay. Uh, well, I think we, uh, we've we slightly um, overrun, so apologies for that. Um, if you do have any uh, additional questions, um, we will be responding to anything, um, any additional questions that we didn't have a chance uh, to get to by email. Um, and also, we'll be sending out the email with um, the link to the recording. So if anything comes up um, afterwards, feel free to respond to that email, um, and we will... Um, uh, we can follow up with you about that afterwards. Um, a couple of final points here, someone's saying, do they get a copy of the slides? Yes, absolutely, we can send those out. Um, and thank you all very much for uh, for joining us today. Yes, thank you.